Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And that mission has led me to create the Become a Better Investor community. In the community, you get access to the tools that you need to create, grow, and protect your wealth. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your spot. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Rick Jordan. Rick, are you ready to join the mission? What's shaking? I am ready to join the mission. Let's go. I am happy to have you with us, and I want to introduce you to the audience. Rick Jordan, is a magnetic personality constantly appearing on global media and speaking on stages across the United States as an inspirational speaker, cybersecurity expert, and mindset motivator. Rick is the founder and CEO of Reach Out Technology, which just had its initial public offering. And in his free time, as if he has free time, he is the host of the popular podcast, all in with Rick Jordan. Rick, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you bring to this wonderful world. That was amazing. Thank you for that. I, I love, I love that when I, I just look back and I, I hear all those things, and you talk about the value, right? Because I think about when I hear all those things, it's like, wow, none of that happened overnight. And I think that's most of what the value is that I'm able to bring is just tremendous breadth of not experience, but experiences that I've had in my life. You know, it's, I think that's a good and important differentiation is experience versus experiences, right? Because experiences, I think, are what grew wisdom. And as I've entered my 40s, I start to realize that I really knew nothing in my 20s and 30s with, with, with what's been shaken down. But the, the, everything from the death of my dad all the way to bringing a company public into a public roll-up with mergers and acquisitions. There's a big journey along the way. Mm. And I, you know, one of the things that I love about business and having a, an exciting business career is that when you walk into a, a meeting now with that much experience, you know, you bring a lot of value to the table and that value is not like, okay, here's how you, here's how you create this product or <clears throat> It's not this narrow value. It's a much bigger skill set. Hey, wait a minute. I've been through this. I've seen where it goes. You may want to consider X, Y, or Z. And for the teams that are open to listening, then you know they get some real value out of that. And I think I would also just mention about your podcast, because I know you've got um, about a 4.7 out of 5 rating on iTunes, which is fantastic. And maybe you can just talk a little bit about what you're doing with the podcast and what do listeners get when they come to this podcast? Because I know my listeners love finding new podcasts. Well, thank you, brother. It's a lot of fun. And I, I've been asked before why I started the podcast and, you know, almost so, it's similar to your story, right? Somebody told me I should. That's really what, what it came down to. This was four years ago, right? And now 300 episodes later, here we are, you know, to, to where we're both, you know, in mm. multiple dozens of countries across the world. I'm so grateful for it. But I never stopped making it because, it, as you say, in my free time, I love bringing value to people. I, I love being able to help them get, get from point A to B. And mindset is a big thing because you, you were mentioning a little bit about the the experience, right, the, and the mm. wisdom that I can bring into a room. And I, I know that I can at this point. And to not say that I've got it all together because I look back and I think that this is something, an important key. And it's a shift that I had to make a few years ago, right? Because I would still walk into rooms and think like, oh, well, I've never done this before. You know, what value could I bring? And I think about a very specific instance when I was asked to speak on a stage three years ago. It's like, there's all these other people in the room that have accomplished so much more than me. But then as soon as I get on stage, which was supposed to be 20 minutes, turned into an hour and 10 minutes because of Q and A. And mm. it was just blown away. You know, because of the, I just showed up with everything that I had. I was all in, in the moments. And it was a shift for me, almost like a slap in the face to recognize that even though it might not be that exact thing, 
because our experiences and our temporary defeats, not necessarily our failures, but our temporary defeats that we've had going along the way, which I know we'll talk about one of mine today, right? With my worst investment ever. Yep. And moving that into what you were talking as far as applying that to what exists today. You know, as long as you can have compassion for yourself in those temporary defeats and take the learnings from them, you can bring the value in those temporary defeats to multitudes of circumstances. So even if it's not a, not a, hey, I know the exact path you should take. It could be the question, well, did you think about this when you're giving advice? Mm. Because I went through this or I could see this and you don't even have to tell them why. It's because of the other things you've been through. Yep. It's uh, it's interesting. And I while you were talking, I was just going online to see about <clears throat> maybe you could just talk about the IPO, you know, and what you've recently done, you know, with that and kind of what 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 have you learned from that so far? And then after that, we'll get into the story. Yeah, the, the biggest thing I've learned from taking a company public and, you know, we've done it in a mini IPO fashion under Regulation A. You know, uh, that's that's kind of a, the first step because you can be public without being listed. And our listing, we intend to list on NASDAQ in the next two years after we throw up a lot of top line revenue and a big valuation, of course. Yep. And then that's even just another stepping stone to continuing our mission. But throughout the last three years, because it took three years to bring this to fruition. And our press release just went out last week for our first acquisition for the roll-up that we closed for $6.6 .6 million. You know, coming from the point where I signed the deal, I inked the deal with the consulting company to put the team together to the point of our first acquisition was three years. Mm. So the biggest learning I had from that is it took three times as long and three times as much money as I anticipated that it would. <laughs> That is a lesson. And it also is a lesson in persistence because I think a lot of people don't realize that many of their dreams could be farther away than they think. And uh, I was just been reading, rereading uh, Michael Gerber's The, on the E-Myth book. And he talks He's about the cool entrepreneurial yep. seizure and that concept that we just get so caught up in our idea that we just really don't see. And most people are in business because they went through an entrepreneurial seizure and they're, they're in it five years later only because of that entrepreneurial seizure and they can't get out. You so, got it. I love his perspective on a lot of things. Like yeah, for me, it's the only, the only difference between winning and losing is not quitting. Yeah, yeah. And you're in good company, Rick, because uh, today it's October 5th, uh, 2022. And uh, in a few days, I'm going to interview Mike, Michael Gerber. And oh, I'm looking awesome. forward to having him on the podcast and learning more from him about his journey of what he's been doing. So I'm excited. So he's a good dude. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. And I'm really looking forward to it. So, well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and tell us your story. Sure. Yeah. The, there was a, a gentleman who actually stood up in my wedding. This was uh, 21 years ago now, and he was in the same industry, right? He was actually an individual who I ended up partnering with when I initially formed my company, when I started out on my own. And it was an interesting scenario because there was some financial trouble that existed that I didn't know about, you know? So then through that, through that discovery, I decided to not take on a partner again, <laughs> you know, like literally ever. But now, I mean, it's it's interesting because I did an IPO. I guess you could look at it as all the investors, all the shareholders are technically some kind of partners in some mm. way or another. Mm. But it's a, it's a different perspective. So he ended up teaching me a lesson to begin with as far as, you know, different viewpoints and then also different responsibilities within business. And this was 14 years ago. So then I started launching. I started skyrocketing. And at the same time, he started declining. So if you think about it as almost like line graphs, right? You could see that there was a point of intersection mm. to where I surpassed him within a couple of years. He kept declining and I kept accelerating. And this was a good friend of mine, uh, obviously from way back when, actually even a, a leader in the youth group that we had and looked up to him, got to the point to where he was really, really hurting, right? And maybe producing about $150,000 in, in revenue uh, on an annual basis. That's it, you know, in, in before expenses 
So you might think he was probably in that category that the SBA, the Small Business Administration, counts as saying the average small business owner takes home $59,000 a year, which I think is horrible, right? You might as well work for somebody else in that mm-hmm. case. It's it's horrendous if that's what it is. You've got way more stresses, way more pressures, way more emotional load than working for somebody else if you're only doing that. So if you're not in a business to build it to even sell to begin with, you shouldn't be in business at all. Personal opinion, it's treat, treated me well with that outlook on life. Now, he got to the point to where he was struggling, right? Asked me to borrow money because we were still friends even through the turmoil that we had. And I said, you know what? I don't think that's going to be the wise move for me. I think the wise move, because I don't believe that you could potentially pay it back. So this would be more like a gift. You know, I think the wise move would maybe let's have a heart to heart and maybe you should go look to work for somebody else Mm -hmm. because of your, your current state. And seeing as how I have a successful business, we've passed seven figures in revenue. Now I believe that I could just acquire you, your customer base. So if I look at your, your past year, right? Of $150,000, you're probably worth about one X as a, as a generous offer, yep. right? Because that's inclusive of expenses and everything else. And that was my first mistake. <laughs> my worst investment ever well, it was overvaluing the business, <clears throat> right? At, at a one X. And at the same time, he was a friend. So there was a, there was an emotional attachment that I had to this as well. My, my compassion runs deep, man. And it it always will, even without the possibility of knowing that I'm never going to be taken advantage of because I know that I will uh, by individuals that are out there. I'm never going to stop having compassion because I believe that's what we're here on earth for is to help other people in whatever way we can. I know we'll be burned. I just know to be a little more careful in some scenarios and ask some some better questions (laughs) at this point. So taking a look at that, I mean, we started looking through his assets, right? And I'm like, cool, I can take on these customers and I know that I can triple because I know what his offerings were and I know how I ran my business and I know what made me successful. I can triple his revenue pretty much overnight by taking all of these on. Then he's got a good domain name, right? Chicagoconsultants.com. I still own that domain name to this day, not being yeah. used. You know, but that was the one that, that I acquired. I'm like, I want your phone number. I want these assets. And that way, everything that you did to to operate and run business, that's what I want. And we'll value you at one X. It's like, awesome. That works. You know, I, I, and he, I mean, just in tears because he's, he, it got him out of a lot of difficulties, you know, which was phenomenal. I, I, I'm grateful for that part of it. Within, uh, within six months, none of the customers were still with me because they ha- had all moved with him. There wasn't really any solid documentation in place. It was just a very simple contract that we had for the purchase of those assets. No real non-compete that was listed within this. And it was just more of kind of on an honor system, just an understanding that he would be going to work for somebody else because after those six months, he ended up going back into business for himself. Mm. And of course they all came back, right? And so l- looking back, there was a couple of things. I mean, it was a complete loss with the exception that I still have the domain name. <laughs> that's really that's really it. And it's not a bad domain name. So and if know, any listeners want to buy it, I'm sure a good price would come out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, someday I'll use it. I buy funny domain names sometimes just as I have these crazy ideas in my head. Yep. But that's one that I've kept. I mean, even if I've just kept it just as a reminder for real. You know, that that was something that I never should have walked into without actually getting some some more information. So there were there were three mistakes and one I haven't talked about yet. The first one was obviously not under really understanding or overvaluing his business. Right. The second was not having the, the correct legal structure in place and not even, you know, I, I think I run to rocketlawyer.com or something, you know, right. and I, I was I was young at the time to to bring this up. So there wasn't really any non compete. And then all the customers went back to him after he went back into business for himself under a different name, mind you, right? Because he could, which was very interesting to me as well. But then the third one is that I allowed emotions to get attached to this in my motivation for doing it because my motivation out of the, out of the gate was really to, to help a friend. And I think that, I think that there's certain directions that relationships can go and should go. 
I think business partners can become friends, but I don't think friends can become business partners. Mm. You know, because the the motivations I don't believe are combat are compatible when it goes in that direction, and that was the emotional tie that I had because I genuinely wanted to help the dude. Right. You know, right. And that's so now it's even talking with mentors in my life. It's what's what's the way to go about this, and that's one of the things that I've found is that business partners can become friends, but friends typically do not make good business partners or business associates. Yep. So if I, I'm going to just first summarize the lessons that you learned. The first was you learned about overvaluing. And the second one you learned about is getting the right legal structure. And then the third one is about emotion and don't let emotion drive that. And maybe I'll share a few things I was writing down. Um, you know, that $59,000, I think we need to talk about that for a moment because for the listeners out there, basically what this $59,000 is that you've quoted is coming from, according to you, the um, Small Business Association saying that the average business owner is paying themselves $59,000 a year. Now, the average college grad is getting something like 45 or something like that. I don't know what the latest is on yeah. that. But so <clears throat> the average business owner is not making much more than, let's say, the average college grad. And what's ha happening in most businesses is that they're underpaying themselves because if they were to pay themselves fully, they would be making a loss. And basically, I always give advice when people say, how do I increase my exit value? And I say, first thing to do it and do it today, double your salary. Bingo. And you what people it. say is, I can't, my business can't sustain that. And I say, exactly. Because if me as a financial guy, if I look at your company and I either think about buying it myself or one of my clients looks at buying it, we're going to say, okay, let's imagine you walk out the door and your management team walks out the door and I have to replace all of you at market price. I have to go out there and hire some great people to run this business. Is the revenue of this business sustainable enough to, to manage, to, to be able to generate a profit out of that? And usually the answer is no. Now that brings me to a second point of advice that I give besides uh, doubling uh, your salary. And that is every small business, in my opinion, is a race, a race to three to $5 million in revenue. Bingo. And, and the reason why is because the, in order to operate a proper business and not just destroy yourself and all of your employees, you need infrastructure. And that infrastructure has to do with hiring good a management team of three to five good people in marketing and production, whatever those main, main areas, sales, you can't do it all. So you have to build a sustainable business and that means you need a management team. But it gets worse because you also need an operating system for running the business. It could be, if it's a production, it could be an uh, ERP type of system. You may need a CRM type of system. You may need an accounting system. You may need all of these human resource systems. And all of a sudden you realize, holy crap, there's a lot of infrastructure you need to build a quality and sustainable uh, business. And that also reminds me of one of the episodes in your podcast where you say consistent growth beats raw talent. And you could just say even worse Bingo. than raw talent, just blood, sweat, and tears. No, we need consistent growth and not in revenue, but in profit. Now, the last thing I would say about this aspect is the concept of the dividend. To be successful in business, your number one goal should be to pay a dividend. Why is that? That is because a dividend must be paid out of profit. So in order to produce, produce real evidence that you have a sustainable business, you need to get, not, <clears throat> number one, you need to get to three to $5 million in profit. And number two, you need, or sorry, in revenue. Number two, you need to start paying out dividends because ultimately, as an outside investor, that's the only thing that I can get out of your business. So those are some, some things that I thought about. And the other thing I thought about is uh, there's, always, there's a saying that people say, there's no such thing as a bad asset, just a bad price. Well, maybe the price in this case could have been zero. But you know, that, that you know, makes me think about key man risk, which we always talk about when you're acquiring businesses. And the key man risk is, okay, what if this key man is out and we have to run this business? What's going to happen? But you don't often think about the other key man risk. What if this guy goes and set up, sets up a competing business? 
Now, of course, we have non-compete clauses and things like that, but eventually that person is going to go and set up. And I think when you're buying a company, you should think that to think, okay, how do we make this company better, stronger, faster, so it can compete when that person gets out of their non-compete period and decides, I understand this a lot better now, and I'm going to start a new company. And um, <clears throat> the last thing I just wanted to say is, if you're a business owner, if you're a business manager, and you have an opportunity to help a friend, stop. Your obligation is to help your customers, your employees, and your shareholders. And if you break that obligation to those people, you are breaking trust. So if you want to help a friend, I like the idea that you did, that you said is maybe I should just give a grant or maybe something like that, you know, not a loan. People come to me for loans. I say I don't give loans, but I do give, you know, gifts. And here's a hundred bucks. Anything you would add to that, that discussion? Opinion. Just uh, just one, and that has to do with the with the acquisition that I just closed. I mean, going from one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to six point six million on an acquisition is a big jump. Mm -hmm. You know, there there was a couple others in, in the middle of that, but throughout this process for this one, you know, ha having learned the lessons, and that this is the the emotional detachment that I know you have to have mm -hmm. now at this point. You know, even though you want it to happen, and I, I still one of the pillars of why I took the company public was to build wealth within mm -hmm. individuals, within these owners who are only making, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year to give them a chance at real wealth with a public company. It's a great mission, right? To create real wealth for, for this industry. Through the process, I had one of my VPs asking me because we got down to some negotiations in the deal. And there was a couple things that I would not budge on. And she asked me the question, okay, are you willing to walk away from this? Or she phrased it better, like you're willing to walk away from it? you know, almost like out of, uh, out of surprise I said, yeah, I am. Because to your point, Andrew, it's mm. the responsibility that I have to the business itself, to the shareholders, to the employees that are currently working for me to keep the, the right position for them. That's the responsibility that I bear now, at least back then it was me and maybe two other people, but now it's me and several dozen people. It's a different story. Yeah. And as a, as an analyst, since my career started in 1993, looking at public companies all of my career, you know, that is the lesson when you go public, you know, you now have 6 million shares to think about. Yeah. And they're going to be distributed across a lot of different people. But if you stay true to providing, and, and I also would, I have a little rant that I'll just mention, and it's not to do with you or anything, but <laughs> this is, be very careful if you hear about shit, stakeholder capitalism bullshit. Do not let that distract you from delivering shareholder value to your shareholders. Nothing wrong with being engaged with share, stakeholders, whether that's employees, whether that's the community, it's fine. But be careful because you don't want to get distracted to your mission, which is to deliver value within society's legal framework to deliver value to your shareholders. So just a little, a little high horse. You got it. I appreciate that, uh, that perspective. That's in my head literally every day, man. <laughs> yeah. It's a different and, uh, world I, now that we're public. I, I just put out a little post on LinkedIn saying, I'm looking for someone to debate me on ESG. Everybody's in favor of environmental, social, and governance. And I would like to have a debate about this topic because I have a lot of thoughts on it, but that's a debate for another day. <clears throat> now, based upon what you learn, from this story and what you continue to learn. Let's imagine a young person in your same situation. What one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Oh, goodness. Uh, the, one of the best books that I've ever read that has gotten me through a lot of things is called The Wisdom of Walt. And it, it's about Walt Disney and the journey that he took and the perspective that he took in building Disneyland. You know, and it, it didn't have much to do with his motion pictures or anything, but the wisdom that is literally in that book is what's gotten me through a lot of things over the last couple of years. It's incredible. Mm. Right. And uh, I'm just typing that into um, the wisdom of Walt and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put that into the show notes so you can just click on it and go to it. I think that's a, a great uh, resource. So my last question for you. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? 
oh, the next 12 months, 50 million in top line revenue, pushing up as many acquisitions as we possibly can to build the value for the shareholders. That is a clear mission, ladies and gentlemen, a great example. And listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet joined the Become a Better Investor community, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your spot. As we conclude, Rick, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just go all in. Anything that you decide to do, don't half-ass it. Go all in. Go all in, ladies and gentlemen. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. Fellow risk takers, let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.